When you have Indian parents, effectively, they only believed, you know, in, in three professions. You either became a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. <laughs> So I fell into the stereotype, albeit that my father's um, brother had an interest in the law, but I don't think he pursued it professionally. And um, I was the youngest daughter, and um, my parents have, I have three older brothers. And uh, so we all pursued the, a, a profession in some way or another. But fundamentally, my parents were interested in ensuring that education was key to their children's lives. And they felt that um, education was your passport to the world, that if you had education, you could go and do anything. And it would serve a profession and a livelihood and would look after you for the rest of your life. Being the daughter and having three older brothers meant that I did see my brothers be treated in one way and I was treated in another way. And I couldn't help it. So for probably the first 16 years of my life, I was a boy and I did everything that I could possibly do to be a boy. So I had short haircut, I wore boys' shoes, I rolled around in mud with them and I did everything that I could. To ensure that I wasn't treated differently, I noted the difference. And um, much to my mother's um, distaste, she would put this beautiful pink frilly dress on me and I would hate it and I would deliberately go in mud and roll around in order to be able to get it dirty so she had to change me and then I'd put I'd be in boys clothes and I'd be a lot happier so so there was a difference it felt um, that it was different and then eventually she gave up because she would often say no you can't change the plug no you can't change the light bulb no you can't do the plumbing and to prove her wrong I would go and do it and then she got to the point where she said you know there's no point telling you you can't do things you're just gonna go and do it aren't you Yes, I'm just going to go and do it. The journey from Africa to, to the UK is, is quite an important part of who I am that shaped my decision to go to the law, into the law. Um, so I very much chose to be a barrister because I believed in equality. I believed in getting a skill set that would allow me to advocate for people who didn't have a voice. And I grew up in what was then Rhodesia and uh, became Zimbabwe. And it was obvious that everyone focused on South African's apartheid, but they didn't focus on Rhodesia's apartheid in the same way. And, and the seeds of inequality was, was sown very early on. But I grew up in a community where we looked up to icons like Nelson Mandela and uh, Mahatma Gandhi. My mother met Mahatma Gandhi. And so, she, so very much part of growing up was looking at these amazing civil rights leaders, these people who spoke about equality and the importance of equality. So I think very early on my views were shaped by my community and shared, very much shaped by my mother and my parents' experience of being immigrants in Africa, from India into Africa, living in poverty and then growing up through that. So I chose a profession where I, I hoped that I would have the tools and the education to make a difference to people's lives. I always knew going to the bar was going to be hard, but I never made easy choices. I did go, my education, part of my education was choosing a course that had, was four years, of which it involved getting legal experience, and we called it sandwich courses in those days. And I did it because I, I knew I needed experience. I knew I needed a differentiator to enable me to go and talk about why I was interested in law and demonstrate that I had made a very conscious decision. So when I applied to the bar and um, at my university, we had people who would come and talk to you about different professions, and we would have mock dinners in the way you would have when you go to the bar. You, you part of your qualification was um, having dinners and dining at the bar, and it meant that it was a means by which you connect with barristers, and it was it was akin to an apprenticeship. And. I recall being the only Indian in the village, you know, I would regularly go to these dinners and I would just be the only Indian face. And I knew straight away and through the conversations that I've had that this is not going to, this was going to be the norm going forward. And it was the norm, but it didn't stop me. I think internally, my one goal about equality kept me going. My desire and need to make a difference kept me going. So I had approached the bar and in, at that time only in 1994 when I was called to the bar, London was the only place that you could apply to become a barrister and train to be a barrister. And there, was, there were lots of different um, 
uh, concepts that existed for people like me who were unconnected to the law, who did not have inroads into the law. And um, effectively, um, there was a concept called ghetto chambers. So if you were Asian or black, the idea was that you would apply to those chambers where black and Asians existed and you would go and do immigration uh, and criminal law. You would not actually, in fact, you were discouraged from applying to chancery chambers and to planning sets or to sets where a high quality of work was done. And, um, and I bucked the trend, I refused to do that. There was no natural home for a, a, an Asian or a black individual coming in who wanted to be a barrister. Um, and I, I fundamentally recoiled from that. When you go to the bar, there's so many things that is wrong. I, you're young to start off with. So people naturally assume because you're young, you're inexperienced and therefore you're no good. Um, you're a woman, so clearly you're not smart enough. You're black, so clearly there's something definitely wrong with you because there's no way you're smart enough. So you have all those things, and of course I'm short, which didn't really help either. And so I went to court, I got a return brief to go and do a bail application. And the individual I had to go and interview was sitting in, in uh, uh, downstairs at the magistrate's court and I had to go and see him and interview him. And he looked at me, he went, there's no way you're my brief. No fucking way. And I'm sorry to swear, I'm sure you'll have to edit that up. There's no way. And he swore and he was vociferous about it. And he and and that's even before I'd said a word. And and he was kicking around, kicking chairs around, and, and he was you know, shouting out expletives. And the expletives de facto were about my my race, my colour, my gender. In, in Africa, it was really obvious, you know, that's your swimming pool because you're brown, you go to that swimming pool, you go to that shop, you're white. And when you're growing up, you, that's the way you live your life. So you didn't see anything wrong with it. And, and we, we, were, we lived a fantastic life in Africa. We had amazing education, we had amazing access to things and an incredible community. So I never felt that, but I understood that it was inequality and I thought it was wrong. But it's only until I came to Britain that I felt real racism. I recall being on a playground and I must have been about nine, eight or nine, and a group of delinquents were running through the playground and, this, and one of them mustered up as much spit as he could with everything else mixed in and just spat in my face and called me a packy. And that was the first experience. That was horrific. And I recall just standing there, just taking this huge bit and wiping it off and just, you know, throwing it and then eventually cleaning up. And that never leaves you. And that feeling never leaves you. And I think that that is what continues to drive me and drove me through the bar, which is that no one should ever experience that. The, the one case that perhaps remains with me and will remain with me forever relates to a terrorism case, which was Canada's uh, worst terrorism case. And it was a bombing over Nova Scotia of an Air India flight. And it was discovered that it was, it was a bombing by uh, Sikh extremists. And they had um, prosecuted the, the criminals who were responsible for it. But 15 years later, 10, 15 years later, the forensics had moved so uh, magnificently that they were able to connect a bombing in Narita Airport with this bombing of Air India. And the bomber lived in the UK. So they extradited him back and there was a judicial review proceedings to challenge the decision to send the bomber back because he'd already done his, com completed his service, his uh, community, com community service, his prison sentence and was back in the UK and Jack Straw had said yes send him back and he's, his legal team challenged that decision. So we acted for the Canadian Department of Justice and, and I think for me I, it was one of my proudest moments. It was an enormous privilege working with these incredible barristers, um, Clive Nichols QC and Hugo Keith QC, who, from whom I was just inspired. And through them, I found out about Claire Montgomery QC. And she was something, someone who fascinated me. The concept of this incredibly bright woman who's a silk at the bar, that was, that was a nugget. That was gold dust, knowing that there were these incredible women who could be role models 
that was a seed planted and I think that having that access to a case like that where you meet incredibly bright people it opens your eyes to it you've got to be open to the experience but it opens your eyes to other possibilities having a partnership having a husband who treated you as an equal who pulls his way at home who you know he organizes the kids you know he gets uniform he gets them breakfast he knows which day is music day um, having him do those things and being such a, an amazing father has meant that I can do the things that I need to do and he absolutely believes in me and I couldn't be or do any of the things that I do today without him um, he's absolutely my rock